just bow your heads and just think about the Lord right now. Just get our minds on Him as we become one body, one mind, and one accord. Just to think of His goodness. Think of His mercy. Lord, we're so thankful today, God. We're so thankful for your goodness, God. We know that you reign. You're still in control in this world that's full of chaos, God. We know that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. God, we know that you are in control, God, and our trust is in you. And we come this morning, God, to thank you for your goodness. We thank you for our families. We thank you for our church. We thank you for all the things that you've done for us, God. But more than anything, we just want to give you praise today. God, you deserve all of the glory. You deserve all of the honor and all of our worship, God. And this time, we want to dedicate it to you, Lord God, that our minds are on you. It's fixed on your goodness. It's fixed on your mercy. It's fixed on your glory, God. We want your glory and your presence to fill this house today, God, to minister to our hearts, Lord God, because we know that we are in need of you. We need a Savior, God. We need you, God in this desperate time, Lord. We need you in the good times. We need you in the valleys. We need you in the hard times. God, we're so, so thankful for you. You have been faithful. Oh, all of my life, God, I have seen your goodness, God, from the moment that I was born, God, until this day, Lord, I have seen your goodness. I've seen your faithfulness, and I'm so thankful. And I just want to think about your goodness today. Think about your mercy. Think about your grace. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. And in your own way, just give him glory and give him worship. Hallelujah, Jesus. We love you. We welcome you into this house today, Lord. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Let your presence fill this place, Lord. We're so blessed, Lord Jesus, that we're able to enter into your house. We're so blessed, God, that we're able to gather together still in one mind and one accord to worship you and to honor you. Hallelujah, Jesus. You're worthy, God. You're worthy, God. We bless you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. He is good. It's good to see Nikki and her family. I think it's Mike. Is that right? I would hate to say the wrong word, but I'm thankful to see you this morning. Your beautiful children. God has blessed your family so much. It's good to see you. I don't know every visitor's name, but um, it's good to have this gentleman here on the back row. We're so thankful that you're here today with us. Amen. And uh, I hope I don't miss any visitors. Good to have all the home folks. Good to see. And if, if you're not considered a visitor, you're considered home folk. And if the next time you come, you're not considered a visitor, you're considered home folk. So, so if you come back again, we'll just, we just be thankful you're with us. Let's stand and worship him. My God, how great you are. How great, how great you are.
some prayer requests, uh, Sister Kathy and Sister Gwen, Sister Jane, um, Brother Dwayne's wife, Stacy, um, remember Sister Catherine, Brother Guy, uh, let's continue to remember our community, our country, um, if you got any unspoken requests, just show them by the uplifting of hands, pray with me, Lord we love you, we thank you God for the opportunity to be in your house, to worship you, God to give you the praise that you deserve for everything that you've done for us, 
I pray, God, that you'd be with uh, Sister Kathy and Gwen, Sister Jane. Lord, reach down and touch Stacy Henry, God. Sister Catherine, Lord, I pray, God, that you send healing to her body right now. Brother Guy, Lord, as you's uh, still on the ventilator, Lord, I pray that you touch him right now, Lord. Lord, be in our community, Lord. Help us to spread your word to our community, Lord. Pray that we bless our country. Lord, as we continue through this trying time, Lord, I just pray that you be with all of us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Change your life. Oh, change for fear bound. 
to be a hindrance to the move of God. I really don't ever want to be in the way of God's movement in the spirit right now. And I really feel in my spirit right now. Somebody here today that needs some deliverance, and I feel God just put it in my spirit that we just need to worship and give this person a chance. If you're here today and you're hurting and you need some prayer, please, this is your chance. We are here for you. Can we just worship the Lord for just a few moments right now? Don't let this time go by. God is here right now. So whatever your problem is, He wants to fix it. Show us your glory, show us your glory, show us your glory, in wonder and surrender we fall down. Show us your glory, show us your glory, show us your glory, let every burning heart be holy ground. Show us your glory.
that we're speaking right now, God. I'm praying in the name of Jesus that you save the soul that you're reaching for in this place right now, God. We will stop this service for this to happen in the name of Jesus. That is how important God is feeling that you are right now, that he would reach for you in this moment right now in this place. Hallelujah, Lord. God, saturate them with your love. Let your spirit pour out upon them. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. There is no peace like his peace. There is no joy. You'll never find joy in, unless it's in the presence of God. Hallelujah, Jesus. We thank you. Thank you, Lord. I pray right now that each of you, especially that has been in, in church your whole life, I pray right now that you stop being a hindrance to what's happening. This seriously is a very important place right now in the spirit. God is reaching for a soul, and they do not feel like there is hope, and they feel like there is no way that someone's going to love them. There needs to be some love in this house right now and compassion for someone who seriously feels there is no hope. Church, pray like you've never prayed before and pull them out of the fire. God has said that that's what he's called us to do, to pull them out of the fire in the name of Jesus. Don't let me be a hindrance to this service right now. This is about a soul, God. This is about a soul. We've asked you to send them, Lord. We've asked you, God, to send them to this spirit, God, that we're feeling right now, Lord. Jesus, we want them to come and we're lifting you up, God, and we want them to find hope and we want them to be changed, God. Not just to enter into your house, but to leave with your spirit within them, God. Let your spirit move. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. You are here in this house. In the name of Jesus, awaken us, God, to this hour. Help us to see, Lord God, how desperate it is that we reach ever so. God, that we just, we give time, Lord God, for you, Lord Jesus, to move and work. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. You're worthy, God, you're worthy. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Here as we wait, we seek your face. Lord, come and make your throne upon our praise. Here in this place, have your way. The moment that we see you, we are changed. Show us your glory. Show us your glory. In wonder and surrender, we fall down. Show us your glory. Show us your glory. to 
on, church. Let's thank him this morning. Hallelujah. We worship you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for your name is power. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. We know that it's more than just a name. Praise God. But when you speak the name of Jesus, hallelujah, amen, there is true, amen, and wonderful power. Can we thank him one more time today? Well, we thank you, God, the change is coming. Hallelujah. We worship you this morning. Blessed be the name of the Lord today. Hallelujah. I am so thankful. Amen. Praise God for once again to be in the presence of the Lord. So good to be in the house of God together. Amen. So good to see each of you today. Amen. Praise God. Good to have Paul Daniels with us this morning. Amen. And praise God. We're honored that he is here. Amen. And then Mike and Nikki, so good to have them and their family. Praise God today. Uh, you can be seated for a moment. I want to share with you um, a story that a brother Jerry Dillon shared yesterday. And uh, the pastor in Madison, Mississippi, every Saturday he shares a story. And uh, the story he shared yesterday was back in the 70s. He and his pastor went to go hunting in the, it was the early winter in the, uh, in, I guess, the swamps of Louisiana, and uh, when they were on their way, they were in a boat, they had to go back to where they were going to be hunting, a uh, terrible storm came in, long story short, it, it sunk their boat, and they didn't know if they were going to make it, but God miraculously uh, helped them get through it, but the point he was making is, he said, we were so far away from anybody that even if we were somehow able to survive not drowning, uh, we would be so away from everybody that we would end up still. He said we would, we would die of hypothermia. We just, there's not a, we were too far away and it was too cold. But he said as they got to the, to the, through the field, and he said we started climbing up out of the ditch, there were car lights on this country road. He said, but what had happened was there was an 80-year-old woman that was in her living room sitting by her fire, reading her Bible, when God just impressed upon her to go to the store. And she said, I don't need to go to the store. I don't drive at night. I don't have any need to go to the, I don't need anything. But she said everything, everything she was saying as to why she shouldn't go, she found herself getting up and putting on her coat, and it was her that rounded that corner when they were coming up out of the ditch. And they waved her down, and they said, Ma'am, we're in trouble. We, we need help. And uh, he said she started worshiping and saying, Oh, thank you, Jesus. Uh, you're the reason that God told me to go to the store. Amen. I believe that God speaks to his people. I believe that there are divine appointments uh, that God makes in our lives where we may not know how it's going to happen, when it's going to happen, uh, but understand today that God has a purpose and a plan for each one of our lives. You believe that today? Can we one more time put our hands together? Can we thank the Lord today? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I want to turn to the Word of God in 2 Kings chapter 6. Amen. I'm going to share with you a... A story in the Word of God that is less than pleasant, amen, but it is part of the realities that, amen, people faced. In 2 Kings chapter 6, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 24, some time later, however, King Benadad of Aram mustered his entire army and besieged Samaria. As a result, there was a great famine in the city. The siege lasted so long that a donkey's head sold for 80 pieces of silver and a cup of dove's dung sold for five pieces of silver. One day as the king of Israel was walking along the wall of the city, a woman called to him, Please help me, my lord, my king, the king. And he answered, If the Lord doesn't help you, what can I do? Amen. Everybody believe that? I have neither food from the threshing floor nor wine from the press to give you. But then the king asked, What is the matter? She replied, This woman said to me, Come, let's eat your son today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So 
We cooked my son and ate him. Then the next day I said to her, Kill your son so we can eat him. But she has hidden her son. When the king heard this, and as you can imagine, he tore his clothes in despair. And as the king walked along the wall, the people could see that he was wearing burlap under his robe next to his skin. Verse 31 says, The king said, May God strike me and even kill me if I don't separate Elisha's head from his shoulders this very day. Elisha was sitting in his house with the elders of Israel when the king sent a messenger to summon him. But before the messenger arrived, Elisha said to the elders, A murderer has sent a man to cut off my head. And when he arrives, shut the door and keep him out. We will soon hear his master's steps following. While Elisha was still saying this, the messenger arrived. And the king said, All this misery is from the Lord. Why? Should I wait for the Lord any longer? Hallelujah. Amen. It's been referenced already concerning the conditions of this year. It's been quite a year, hasn't it? And it ain't even over yet. Amen. It has been one that has many, many difficulties. Praise God. And if we're not careful, we can get the same perspective that the king of Israel here had that would say that all of this misery is from the Lord. And then the question, why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Anybody here this morning ever felt, to God, when are you going to do it? When are you going to hear my prayer? When's the answer coming? It just doesn't seem like there's any relief. I want to, for just a few moments this morning, I want to preach to you concerning this subject. Amen. I believe there is a divine rendezvous. Hallelujah. God has a moment in time designed just for you. And God is going to turn things around. God, we love you. We thank you this morning for your spirit we feel. We're thankful for your word and its authority. God, I feel the resistance here today. And Lord, I understand it. God, I realize this morning that, Lord, it, it's, it's difficult and it's not an easy task living this life. But I'm telling, I believe this morning, God, what I feel in my spirit. Uh, God, this is a rhema word. This is a word that you have given for this particular day and this particular moment uh, for, Lord, very particular people that are here uh, this morning. Uh, I pray, God, as you will anoint not just my voice, uh, but, God, anoint our hearts that, Lord, uh, we would understand and we would see clearly. Uh, we thank you uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can we one more time put our hands together? Can we thank the Lord today? Hallelujah for his goodness. You are wonderful, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. You can be seated. Hallelujah for a moment this morning. It was 10 years in the waiting and about $1.6 billion spent in the making of what was known as the Filet Comet Probe. Amen. I have a picture of this, what's considered a comet probe. The purpose of this contraption is that it would link up with a comet as the comet was hurtling through space at 84,000 miles per hour and was 311 million miles away. Ten years of design. $1.6 billion spent. But this comet probe did exactly as it was designed to do and it landed on its target. The plan is that the fillet will accompany the comet as, again, it hurtles toward the sun and become increasingly active as it heats up. It's going to use 21 different instruments that are going to collect uh, data that scientists hope will help explain 
the origins of comets and other celestial bodies. It was an extremely staggering feat. One can only imagine the patience that it took to wait for the long anticipated rendezvous. Amen. That point in space where this comet probe would meet the comet. Amen. The scientists and the engineers, they had tried to look at every angle. They had tried to, uh, e e to equate uh, and figure of every single condition um, and scenario because they knew that when the probe was on its way to the comet, uh, they would not be able to make any changes. Uh, but they had to factor everything beforehand, uh, and they did that. They were left uh, to trust uh, that they had done their job as best as they were able and the rest would be left up to fate. I don't believe necessarily in luck. I don't believe in, in coincidence, uh, amen, because I believe that we have a God, amen, that has everything under his control. We may not understand why everything happens uh, the way it happens, but I'm telling you this morning uh, that every single person under the sound of, of my voice, uh, God has a particular plan and purpose uh, for your life. Uh, he is, as the scripture declares, uh, the author and the finisher of our faith. Uh, amen. He is orchestrating our lives. Uh, the Bible says that that he is able to see the end while standing at the beginning. His perspective is greater than anything that you and I could ever imagine. And I believe this morning that God has designed a divine rendezvous for you. The word rendezvous, let me define what it is. It means to meet or come together at a particular time and place. Amen. You may say this morning that my life is in such a manner that there's no way God would ever meet with me. There's no way that God would ever come to my rescue. Can I tell you that even in the midst of all the chaos, of all the trouble, amen, none of that, amen, changes God's purpose for your life. Hallelujah. God can work in the midst of your chaos, in the midst of your mess and you not even be aware of it but you're on your way to a rendezvous to a moment a time and a place where God's going to meet with you and going to change your life from here going forward hallelujah in the book of 2 Kings chapters 6 and 7 these two chapters are full of a lot of action I don't know if any of you, amen, I, I realize there are portions of the Bible. I've made it a habit in my life that I, I read the Bible through every year. and I, I have my Bible reading I read every day. And, and there, there are days when you're in the book of Leviticus that you're thinking, oh, can't we get through this quickly? It's a little bit redundant at times. The book of Numbers can be that way. There are places where the scripture is kind of like, oh, okay, I've, I've already read this, it seems like. In the two chapters of 2 Kings, chapters 6 and 7, there's a lot of action. Amen. When you're reading this, there's one thing after another. It begins with Elisha causing an axe head to float. In chapter 6, verse 5, but one of them who was cutting a tree, his axe head fell into the river. Oh, sir, he cried, it was a borrowed axe. Where did it fall, the man of God asked. When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it into the water at that spot, and the axe head floated to the surface. That's pretty awesome. Amen. You go a little couple verses later. When the king of Aram, this is verse 8, was at war with Israel, 
the king of, of, of Syria, he would, he would confer with his officers and, and he would say, we're going to mobilize our forces at such and such place. But when they would make these plans, immediately Elisha, the man of God, he would warn the king of Israel, do not go to that place. For the Armenians are planning to mobilize their troops there. And so the king of Israel would send word to that place indicated by the man of God. Time and time again, Elisha warned the king and that so that he would be on the alert there. The Syrian king started getting frustrated. He thought that one of his officers was a traitor. And, he, and, and they said, it is not one of us, my king, but it's Elisha, the prophet of Israel. He tells the king of Israel, even the words you speak in the privacy of your bedroom. Let me tell you something, friend. You and I serve a mighty God. God can do anything. We know that. But I want to also tell you that God has people, uh, vessels uh, that he uses. Uh, there are those who God speaks to very clearly. Uh, amen. I have been a witness of that. I have seen that happen. Uh, amen. I have learned in my life uh, to listen uh, to the man of God in my life. Uh, I've learned that I'm the beneficiary uh, when I listen, uh, amen, to what the authority that God has placed in my life. You know why? Because there are many times God will give them amen a better perspective a clearer perspective amen they're up on the wall and they're looking out for your life amen it pays you amen to listen because God uses vessels amen just like he used Elisha hallelujah amen verse 13 says that the king of Syria said, go and find out where he is so I can send troops to seize him. i got to get rid of him. He's keeping me from accomplishing the purpose that I have. And so then one night, the Bible says that the king of Syria, he sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. And when the servant of the man of God, we've read this story many times, he got up early in the morning, and as he walked out of his tent he saw that they were surrounded by this enemy's host and he walked into the man of God and he said what are we going to do we are surrounded but Elisha looks at him and says do not be afraid and he began to see made a, he made a declaration he said there are more that are with us that are with them amen and, and then he prayed Lord open his eyes that he may see and the servant and walked back out and then he saw that they were the, the enemy's host was surrounded by a heavenly host amen that had them all surrounded hallelujah amen I'm telling you friend you may not feel like it it may not look like it it may not seem like it but there are more that are for you than those who are against you amen the Bible says greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Amen. If God be for us, then who can be against us? We serve a mighty God today. We serve a God who is able to do anything. Hallelujah. Amen. So then the Bible says that God blinded the Syrians and Elisha led the army right into the middle of Samaria. And then the king of Israel saw them in verse 21. He shouted to Elisha, My father, should I kill them? Should I kill them? Of course not, Elisha says. Do we kill prisoners of war? What does he say? He says, Give them food and drink and send them home again to their master. So the king made a great feast for them, and they sent them home to their master. After that, amen, the, the Syrian army, the raiders of they stayed away from the land of Israel. They had learned their lesson. Amen. You may think you can, you can beat them, but they've got a God on their side that works for them, that, that uses them, that fights for them. There's nothing we can do. So they stayed away from the army or the land of Israel. But the very next verse, sometime 
However, another king in Syria come to rule. And guess what he did? He got his entire army and they went and they besieged the land of Samaria. Can I tell you, let me, re, let me just remind you this morning, the enemy is relentless. He'll never let his guard down. He is always pursuing, looking for an opportunity. Don't think for a moment, well, I beat him. He'll never come back this way again. He may retreat for a moment, but there will be some time later that he will once again, uh, amen, he'll, he'll, he'll bring his attack against you. This time, it was bad. The result was a great famine in the city. The siege lasted so long that there were people selling donkeys' heads. Why? To eat. They, they, they had vendors set up in the street selling cups of dove's dung. Does anybody not know what that is? Because you need to understand, because they were selling it to eat. That gives us the context of how bad the situation was. Hallelujah. There are many of you this morning that have been able to survive the enemy's onslaught in the past, but the battle you're facing currently seems like more than all the other battles combined. You're just not sure that you're going to be able to make it through this one. And then in our reading this morning, amen, the king of Israel was walking along the wall of the city and a woman called out and said, please help me. And he makes a statement that I completely agree with. He said, if the Lord doesn't help you, what is it that I can do? I'm not going to reread what she, what her dilemma was. It was terrible. It was a horrible situation. And it was there, amen, that when the king heard this, he tore his clothes in despair. And as the king walked along the wall, he, he was wearing burlap. I mean, this was a bad situation where the king himself did not know what to do. So he did what a lot of people does. He begins to blame the man of God. Amen. I tell you what I'm going to do, he said. I'm going to make this vow. That before this day is over, I'm going to go and cut off Elijah's head. Now, I don't know how that's going to fix anything. I don't see how that maybe is going to change the scenario. But isn't it amazing how we can lash out at people? And, and, and it don't change nothing. Matter of fact, it oftentimes makes things a whole lot worse. But at that moment, we... We at least think we're going to feel better if we can just give a, pe give a person a piece of our mind. King, you don't know what you're doing. Amen. But he makes this vow. But none of this goes. I mean, Elisha knows exactly what's fixing to happen. Amen. And, and he sends a messenger to Elisha. And Elisha says this is what's taking place. And so when Elisha was still making this statement, the messenger arrived and the king said, All of this misery is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? This is the question that you've got to answer. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Now, if we were to sit down and we would reason with the king and, and, and he would explain to us why he feels this way, he would tell us the story of these two women, how horrible that was. He would explain to us that the condition that the people in Samaria are living, and we would agree it is a horrible condition that they are living in. So we could understand why he would make a statement such as, why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Hallelujah. But can I tell you this morning, the reason that you should wait for the Lord is because He has a divine rendezvous in store for you. The condition
condition that the king is living in, the condition of Samaria, it was horrible. It looked as if there was no way it would ever change. But Elisha's response to the king's question, you find his response in the first verse of the seventh chapter where Elisha says, listen to this message from the Lord. Elisha said, this ain't my opinion. This ain't what I'm thinking. But this is what the Lord is saying. By this time tomorrow, within 24 hours, in the markets of Samaria, the same markets that you are paying, amen, eight pieces of silver for a donkey's head and a cup of dove's dung. He said, tomorrow you're going to be able to buy six quarts of choice flour that's only going to cost you one piece of silver. And you're going to be able to buy 12 quarts of barley grain that's only going to cost you one piece of silver. That, my friend, is a dramatic change in 24 hours. So, King, let me explain to you why you need to wait on the Lord. Let me, let me describe to you why you need to keep believing the Lord. Because God has a divine moment that is going to change your life. And it's going to happen within 24 hours. Amen. <clears throat> there was an officer there in the king's court that heard Elisha make that statement. He said, it ain't never going to happen. He said, I'm sorry, that, that, that's too far-fetched. Elisha looked at him and says, you know what? You're going to see it with your own eyes, but you're not going to be able to experience it. And then the very next set of scriptures we read in chapter, chapter 7, and there were four leprous men at the entering of the gate. There was these four leprous men. Amen. They were, they were not even a part of society. They weren't allowed to be a part of society. Amen. They were in a very bad condition. And one of them looks at the other and says, Why sit we here until we die? They said, Okay, what's our option? Well, we can go into the city, but we'll die there because the famine's there. The other option we have, and the only other option we have, is we can go into the camp of the Syrians. Maybe they'll, maybe they'll have mercy on us. Maybe they'll let us live. Or they'll kill us. But we got to do something. So the Bible says uh, that they arose at twilight, and they went to the camp of the Syrians, but when they came to the edge of the camp of the Syrians, there was no one there in the camp. The Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the sound of chariots and horses and the sound of a great army. There's only four leprous men. Now, logic would say there's four. Every person has two feet, so that's eight feet among the four but they were leprous men, so one of the four may have, been, may have already lost a foot. But even if they had only eight feet, God caused those eight feet, or however many there were, to sound as if they were a mighty army of chariots. God had magnified the sound to the extent that the, when the Syrians heard a sound of a great army, they said one to another that, behold, Israel has hired against us the king of the Hittites and the kings of, the Egypt, of Egypt to come against us. So they fled in the twilight and they abandoned their camp, leaving behind all four leprous men, they, they eventually send word back to Samaria what God had done. And notice in verse 12 that the king got out of his bed in the middle of the night and he told his officers, I know what has happened. He said, this is just a setup. We're going to go there and the Syrians are going to come and they're going to attack us. But we read in verse 
16 that when the people of Samaria they rushed out and they plundered the Syrian camp so it was true that six quarts of choice flour were sold that day for one piece of silver and 12 quarts of barley grain were sold for one piece of silver just as the Lord had promised. It's a divine rendezvous. Amen. We are so quick to, we size everything up. We start trying to do our own figuring. I don't know about you, but if somebody would have said, uh, not only is God going to do this, but God's going to use four leprous men. That would even make it sound even more impossible. But God will use that which you never would have even thought or considered. God would use, but whatever means God needs, He will use it to, to accomplish what He has promised. He is able to perform what He has promised. So it's a divine rendezvous. It's a moment in time, a, a particular moment in time. God knows when that time is. You may not know when that time is, but God knows exactly what and when and where he's going to do it. That's why you need to keep trusting in him. That's why you need to keep waiting on on the Lord. You got to be reminded, we're getting ready to land here in a moment, but you got to be reminded, Jesus, it was He who arrived according to Lazarus' sister four days later. Four days He had been dead. And she said, if you had only been here four days earlier, He would have never died. But it was Jesus who said, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad that I was not there. You know why? Because Jesus was going to make a very clear point that no matter how horrible the circumstances may appear, there is always hope when Jesus steps on the scene. Amen. It was Peter at the end after Jesus had died and Jesus had already been resurrected, but they, they weren't really sure how everything was going to happen. So Peter says, you know what, I'm going to go back to fishing. And he goes fishing. And he toils all night. And they don't catch a thing. And in that morning as they're, they're, they're mending their nets, uh, amen, Jesus looks at Peter uh, and says, hey, did you all catch anything? Uh, they said, man, we've been fishing all night. Uh, we haven't caught a thing. He said, why don't you let your nets down on this side of the of the, of the ship and Peter looked at him and you can imagine Peter's eyes and, and his, 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 uh, his attitude because I know Peter's thinking uh, Jesus who are you to tell me I'm the fisherman surely I've done everything that you would suggest but Peter gets his senses and he says nevertheless at thy word and when Peter does what Jesus says they caught so many fish in that net that the net almost broke and it almost sunk the ship. I'm telling you, church, when God determines when that moment of time is going to be, there ain't a devil in hell. There ain't a circumstance that you're dealing with that can keep God from accomplishing the purpose that God wants to That's why you got to wait on the Lord. That's why it is so important, to, amen, to not give up, to not live in despair. It is so important to, to hang on, amen, to the very Word of God. We're living in unprecedented times. We're seeing the effects of this virus. God, it now you don't <clears throat> you can't get all your information from the media. All right, the media. I think we all understand the media has an agenda, but at the same time, um, 
Brother Guy, today's I believe his 45th day in ICU on a ventilator. Yesterday, a pastor by the name of Jeffrey Sanders, 57 years old, he died yesterday morning. Amen. With complications of the coronavirus. His wife is fighting for her life today. Eli Hernandez, a great evangelist, a couple months ago he passed away. It, 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 it's, a, it's a horrible thing. Amen. Praise God. We've been very blessed here so far. Amen. Sister Hudson uh, tested positive a couple weeks ago. <clears throat> she is in the hospital. Thank God she's doing a little better. We're thankful for that. She was very, very sick a couple of days ago, but she's doing better. Amen. Brother Stevens, they have had a breakout in his where he works. He tested positive yesterday. But again, thank the Lord, he is doing so much better and, and had a couple of days where he was pretty sick. But I mean, I'm, there's so much unknown. And, and, and if we're not careful, fear can get a hold of us. Fear is never the will of God. Never is fear the will of God. Amen. But I'm talking beyond just the coronavirus, beyond the pandemic. I'm talking that there are those here this morning that in your own personal lives, you've had nothing but chaos. It's been one battle after another. You, you, you haven't even been able to recover from the battle before until the next battle starts. And it just is overwhelming to you. I'm, I'm preaching to you this morning that even in the midst of all your pain and all your trouble, God has a divine rendezvous. He has a particular moment in time. I may not know when that'll be. You may not know when that'll be. But I'm telling you, it's there. It's coming. And I'm encouraging you. I'm pleading with you. Hold on. Hang in there. Keep waiting. Keep believing. Keep trusting. Because I promise you this. God will never leave you, nor will he ever forsake you. Hallelujah. <laughs> As we stand here today. statement, or I've heard people make a statement that God will never put more on you than you can handle. That That's not that's not necessarily correct. There are those here today that have faced troubles and trials that nobody was meant to be able to handle alone. But the reality is you will never face something that will ever render God helpless. You'll never face a situation that God is not able to handle. <clears throat> so knowing that, I believe that here today, God, I'm holding on to you. I'm holding on to the promises that you've given me. I'm holding on to the fact that, God, you have a purpose. Even though I may have made some poor decisions and I may have made a mess of my life, I still believe that in the midst of that mess, God is still able to accomplish His purpose. But you got to hang in there. You gotta keep waiting. You gotta keep believing. That's why we are here together as a church. Amen. To reach, amen, across to our neighbor. Amen. And I know we put our hands, we put our arms around you. We're praying for you. We're in this together. I want to help you hang in there. I need you to help me to hang in there. I want to keep believing, amen, that we all together will continue to believe and wait because God has got a moment in time. Jesus, you change everything. This morning as we begin to sing, amen, hallelujah, you know.
know the trials. You know the difficulties. And here's what happens when you've just gone from one difficulty to another. It's easy to get numb. It's easy to just kind of be, to be feelingless. But I'm telling you today, I believe from the beginning of this service, God has been reaching. God has been trying to encourage somebody to say, hey, I've got your number. I know where you're at. I've not left you. I've not forsook you. The enemy's trying to convince you that God don't care about you that God has left you that is not the case if you'll hang in there if you'll hold on God is going to accomplish that purpose in your life I want to encourage you to come, find you a place of uh, prayer, uh, find you a place, uh, amen, to hang in there. Uh, hallelujah. God, help me today. Uh, amen. Can we this morning? Uh, come on, church. Uh, amen. Uh, in the name of Jesus, we thank you today. Oh, God. I'm holding on to all the things that I've 